Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Ariel Property Advisors, Customers Bank, Capital One Bank, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization Handro Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Castamatidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. I like the TV show about being a lawyer. University of Virginia, NYU Law, prosecutor, and a real estate developer. I have Peter Sudler, chairman and CEO of the Sudler Companies. So tell me about the great grandparents. Well, we have a picture of this very religious relative on your father's side. That's my great grandfather, Isaac, who family rumor has it came to America and found that it was not religious enough for him and actually went back to the Ukraine, which was then part of Russia. Let's now go to the next generation, his sons who did come over. Great-grandpa Isaac had 10 sons and one daughter, four of whom came to America. They were my great-uncles, Yonkel, Lemel, Friedel, and my grandfather, Hyman. And the story goes that they were coming through Ellis Island together, and uh, they were asked their names, and Yonkel said Sudler, Lemel said Sudler. Friedel didn't speak very much English, and he misunderstood, and he kept saying in response to, what is your name, Friedel. So I guess the guy got frustrated, and he put down on his papers, Friedman. So half my family today is named Friedman. So not we Sudler. The, we have the Freedmans and the Sudlers. Correct. Any idea of the derivation of how the words the Sudler came out? We don't know how it came out. All we know is that uh, that was the actual name. It was not changed as far as we can tell. So when they arrived in Ellis Island, they didn't stay in New York. They went to Newark, you said. That's right. They settled in Newark. My grandfather, Jaime, started as a carpenter and developed a small construction company, and they did renovations and eventually developed a specialty in doing restaurants. And my grandfather built a lot of restaurants in Newark, New Jersey, and became a moderately successful middle-class builder until the Depression came along. And in the Depression, he got wiped out. And uh, the story goes they lost their house, which was mortgaged, and in those days, you were on personally on a mortgage. So the mortgage foreclosed on the house, and there was still $1,500 left on the bond that my grandfather owed personally. And he had two choices, either get that money, which he didn't have, or go bankrupt. And going bankrupt in those days was not like what it is today. It was considered a scandal. 
and almost akin to being a criminal. And he decided that he did not want to go bankrupt. And so he went around to all the relatives and he begged $1,500 to get off the bond. So he got off the bond and didn't have to go in into bankruptcy. So this is about 1932. Now you said to me, your, your father was born in 1910. Correct. Tell me a little bit about your father. My father started out as a kid in Newark, New Jersey, went to public schools and went to work for his father in the construction business. And they worked together uh, as a contractor until uh, World War II came. And my father then joined the Navy and went into the Seabees. And he was stationed in the South Pacific building airstrips and facilities on all the islands that the Marines would take. And he was there for five years and came back and he was a relatively an older uh, right, gentleman. You said he came back at like 35 years of age. Correct. Tell me about mom's side. My mother was the daughter of a, uh, a man who owned lingerie shops in New York City and on it, Madison it, Avenue. His name was Louis Engler. So when did Mr. Engler's family come over? They came over, we think, probably in the early 1900s or the late 1800s and they were um, shop owners. And he became a fairly successful shop owner. He had five stores on Madison Avenue and um, did quite well until the depression in which he lost most of his stores. When we got together, we spoke about Grandpa Hyman. He came over alone and Grandma Minnie. The, the story was is that uh, there was a pogrom in the Ukraine, in the village that my grandfather worked. He worked for my grandmother's father. And my grandmother's father was apparently killed in the pogrom. And my grandfather and his girlfriend, who later became my grandmother, fled. And they managed to get all the way to Brussels, Belgium. And they didn't have enough money for both of them to get across to America, which is where they wanted to go. So my grandfather, they were not married at this point. My grandfather said, I'm going to go across. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to get money. I'm going to send money, and I'm going to bring you over. In the meantime, my grandmother was stuck in Brussels, Belgium, and she got a job as a maid. And she worked for a family in Brussels who owned a bakery. And if you know anything about the Belgians, they're the, the, the foremost bakers in the world. They put the French to shame. And this family put her to work in the bakery. And she worked there for six months or a year. And she learned how to bake. So when my grandfather got enough money to get her across, she came across. They were married. And my grandmother became the consummate baker in the community. She was famous for her strudel. Did, did she uh, run a retail store? No, she just baked in her kitchen. I remember as a, as a little kid, because we live right next door, I remember her rolling the dough on the kitchen table till it was paper thin for the strudel. That's one of my first memories. Now you told me that grandma, one of the uncles, something, what happened with the strudel? My, the story, the my, strudel story. The strudel story, so my, my grand, <laughs> My, my, my grandmother made strudel that was everybody just loved. And her daughter was married to a doctor, a young doctor. And they lived in the house with them. And the young doctor's name was Bernie Eichler. Loved that strudel. He moved away to Montclair and established a practice, but he used to want that strudel. He had a hunger for that strudel. So the story is one day he sent his son, Eric, to get a, a, a package of strudel that grandma had, had made for, for Bernie, because Bernie was a doctor and that was a big deal in our family. And Eric took two buses, he got the strudel, and he's going back to give the strudel to his father. He's hungry. And he starts eating the strudel and it was so good that he ate all the strudel. Got back to my uncle's house. The physician. The physician, no strudel. And the story is that Uncle Bernie, the physician, was not happy about it, and there was hell to pay. 
But I remember her strudel and her cooking and her baking was superb. So Grandpa Hyman lost money during the Depression. How'd he come back to go into the real estate business? Started working again as a contractor and was able to get jobs. He was, you know, he was well-known, well-liked, and did good work. Right. And he was able to, you know, to get himself out of it. My father had in his head that it would be better to build stuff and lease it and own it rather than to just simply be a contractor because contracting had its ups and downs. But he figured development was going to be something that would be, more, would be steadier. So how did they get involved with Montgomery Ward and the telephone companies? Well, originally he started to build telephone companies for AT&T. In those days, every town had a little telephone company building where they had the operators and the switchboards, usually on Main Street, right in the town. And for some reason, he had nine or ten of these that he built, and he would lease them well, to AT&T. Were they, uh, were they in uh, New Jersey? Or yes, were they, they, were, they were all in New Jersey. He did them in Newark, in Montclair, all over the state. Right. And we still own some of them today. So these were the telephone stations? Yes. Now, how about the story about the Montgomery Ward? Yes. My father somehow, some way, met the director of real estate for the Montgomery Ward Company. And they took a liking to my father. And they wanted warehouses built all around the country. And they would call my father up and say, Sam, go to Peoria, Illinois. Sam, go to Tucson, Arizona. Go to Mishawaka, Indiana. Go to Lansing, Michigan. Go to Orlando, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, all over the country, and build us a warehouse. And my father would go. I used to come home and see him with maps trying to find these places. And he would go buy a piece of land and build a warehouse. And I guess probably over time, he built 30 or 40 warehouses for Montgomery Ward. And that's really what made the company a, a national company. How did Ward make a decision where they wanted it? Was it a distribution to one of their stores? Yes. Or was it more to the catalog business? Or It was both. Apparently, Ward, at the, you must remember, at that in those days, Ward was a competitor of, of Sears. Sears. And they, were, um, they had warehouses to supply their stores and their catalog business all over the country. So my father became the go-to guy for building these warehouses. Now, were they still, uh, was the company still based in Newark at this time? Yes. How did the, uh, the Navy man meet the model? Well, the story I've always heard is that my mother um, was single because there was a scarcity of men. Everybody was away fighting the war. And my father came back. He was 35 years old, and he wanted to get married and have a family. He was introduced uh, to my mother by some friends, from his, uh, friends of his from high school, and they began going out and got engaged and were married in uh, Newark, New Jersey. Now, the stores were on Madison Avenue, you said. Yes. Did they live in New York or did they live in, in Newark also? They lived in Hillside, New Jersey, because my father was working with his father, and they had a little two-family house. I was born in a little two-family house in Hillside, New Jersey. You were born in 1947. Yes. When we got together, you said to me that one of the things, you knew that you wanted to be a lawyer at a young age. I grew up uh, until age five in Hillside, and then we moved to South Orange, New Jersey. I went to public schools. And for some reason, in junior high school or high school, I saw a TV show called The Defenders, and it was about these lawyers. And I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's what I want to do. And I somehow took it in my head that I wanted to be a lawyer at a very early age. Now, you said to me when you were growing up, you were on the construction sites with your dad. Yes. I worked summers, uh, and I would work on construction crews, whatever my father had was building at the time. And when he was not happy with my conduct, in the summer, he would put me on the roofing crews, which was the worst thing. Because on a roofing crew, it, in summer, it's, it's boiling hot. The, the sun is reflecting off the roof. The tar barrel is going, and it stinks. And 
I remember thinking to myself, there has to be a better future for me than doing this. And that's when it came into my head to go to law school. You go to public school and then you went to Columbia High School, you said? I went to Columbia High School, in in, South Orange, in South Orange. And so you're graduating high school, and how did you decide on Virginia? Well, we were only allowed to apply to five schools, and I only had four. And I had met this guy on the beach the summer before, and he was talking about the University of Virginia. That was the only place he wanted to go. And I didn't have a fifth school, and I remembered the conversation. So I applied to the University of Virginia. I got accepted, and then I got a letter that I was going to be an Eccles Scholar, which was a, a fairly uh, big deal at Virginia because they gave you advanced classes and skipped you now, out of most of your first year. So what was this type of scholar? It's become the Jefferson Scholars, but it's uh, basically for honor students who have very good records and good SATs in those days, and you lived in, in, in the same dormitory, you took advanced courses, and I was able to get a first-rate education at the University of Virginia. Now, the summers you said to me when you were at the University of Virginia, you traveled. Yes. Where, where were you? My so first summer, I was uh, uh, traveled to Japan. I taught English at a girls' university. My second summer, I traveled to Africa, to Ghana, and I helped build a school in Ghana. My third summer, I went to uh, Europe and I worked in uh, Denmark. And my fourth summer, I had uh, a military obligation. You know that the military, it's the heart of the Vietnam, that you're gonna be doing something on that. But you applied to law school? Yes. Okay, where did you apply to law school? I applied to um, Georgetown, Columbia, NYU, Harvard, um, and a few others. And how do you decide for the Jersey kid to go to, to Greenwich Village, a.k.a. NYU Law, one of the better schools in the well, nation, I, which you're a trustee of today? I got, I got accepted, and um, I liked Greenwich Village. I remember going there in high school when we were kids, because you could drink in New York at 18. And I remember going to Greenwich Village, and I liked the area, and NYU was a good school, and I decided to go there. So you graduate in 69, and then you get into the U.S. Army Reserve Unit, right? Yes, National Guard Unit in National the Bronx. Artillery, 105th Artillery. We were also mobilized. I got a year off because of the mail strike. Right. I don't know if you remember that. So did I. So okay. I, I do remember going down to, I think, uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard or uh, the Brooklyn Battery Terminal where we sorted envelopes for uh, that's what, maybe for, for three days? Or that's so. what we did. For, for five days, we were the mail service, and it was the biggest mistake that the United States government ever made letting us into the post offices to sort mail because it must have taken them months to straighten out right. I what remember, we did. I remember going into the post office. had no idea how to sort mail or anything. And it was like the blind leading the blind, as they would say. Well, I remember guys were opening up envelopes and reading letters and sending mail to Hawaii and this, that, and the other. It was, it was, it was just the wrong move. So now you come back to NYU. Yes. Okay. You're living in the village. So talk to me about um, what you did the first year. Well, in, the summer. in in law school, your your second summer is very important because that determines. Right, but the first summer. The first summer, I worked in a law firm. Um, and I didn't, didn't like it. You know, I was doing basically discovery and looking at titles and things like right. that. And you said it was ironic because it was real, you were working on real estate. I was estate working in real estate. Okay. Yeah, I was working for a real estate lawyer. Right, which you didn't really want because going back to the defenders, you, you, you had this image of being a prosecutor. Okay. Yes. So talk to me about the second summer. Second summer, all my friends were getting jobs in big Wall Street firms for big money. In those days, you could make big money. And if you did a good job, you could, they would hire you out of law school to work in these law firms. And I knew I didn't want that. So I was wandering around the law school one day. I walked into an office, a criminal law professor there who had this program. And I said, I, I need a job. He said, well, we can get you a job with a defense lawyer. Or there's a job we can get in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. And I said, well, great send me down for an interview. 
I didn't even know the U.S. Attorney's Office was different from the DA's office at that point. They sent me down for an interview. I got hired in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and that literally changed my life. I worked the whole summer in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I worked for the best attorneys in that office. Rudy Giuliani was an assistant U.S. Attorney, uh, Ike Sorkin, Rusty Wing. These are guys who are very well known in the legal field. And I loved it. And at the end of the summer, they said to me, we want you to work your third year here. I said, well, I got to go back to law school. They said, third year of law school is not really important. We want, don't you want to see the cases that you worked on this summer that are going to go to trial in the winter? Don't you want to sit at council table? Don't you want to have the experience? And I said, sure. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I worked my entire third year for nothing in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I went to law school for my third year at the same time. The result of that was very fortuitous because at the end of the third year, I wanted to become an assistant U.S. attorney, but I couldn't because the office rule was you had to have two years out of law school in legal practice of some kind or a clerkship in order to be hired. And I didn't, I was just a recent law school graduate. Some of the guys who I'd worked for said, look, we just got a call from a, an alumni of the office. He's been appointed a federal district court judge here. He needs a law clerk. He asked if we knew of anybody. We recommended you. You've got an interview next week with him. Go take this job if you can get it. I went and interviewed. I got hired. Who was the judge? His name was Richard Owen, and he was a new federal judge, just appointed. And he hired me as his law clerk, and I ended up working for him for two years. And what you do, what type of cases were you working on? We had, we had the, the, the best cases you can imagine. He was an, a composer of operas, Judge Owen, and he was assigned the George Harrison um, case where he was accused of uh, a copyright infringement uh, of the song uh, He's So Fine by the Chiffons. We had the John Lennon immigration case. The Attorney General wanted to deport Lennon, and we ruled that he could not be, the judge ruled that he could not be uh, deported. Uh, the judge found George Harrison guilty of uh, copyright infringement on the song, which nobody to this day understands, but I remember the cross-examination because the judge had a piano brought into the courtroom, and Harrison was on the stand, and they would go bar by bar through the song, and the judge would play this one bar, and Harrison would play it, and he would say, now, are those the same notes, Mr. Harrison? And Harrison had to admit, yet yeah. They went through the whole song, and it was the same notes. So most Although, to me, they don't sound the same. Now, most of these cases were what type of cases? I mean, well, Criminal and civil cases in federal court okay. of every variety. So what type of criminal cases? Oh, we had um, frauds. We had bank robberies. We had uh, drug narcotics cases organized crime cases. Um, now, this was at 26 Federal Plaza? The, no, this was in the courthouse, the United States Courthouse, 40 Center Street. Okay. And our, our chambers were at 26 Federal Plaza, which is across the street. But then we moved into the courthouse when the chambers came available. So you finish your, your, your let's call it internship or whatever you want. Okay. Now the U.S. Attorney's Office said you can come to go to work for them? Yeah, what happened was... I was coming on, uh, up on my two years, and I got an offer from the Organized Crime Strike Force, which was then a little bit independent from the U.S. Attorney's Office, but it had the same offices, and they were doing really good cases. So I took the, uh, the Strike Force job, went to work for the Strike Force. Now, what was the Strike Force? The Strike Force was a Justice Department um, organized crime division appendage in which they would put uh, these groups of prosecutors in various cities where the mafia had uh, a, a, a big presence. And there was one in the Southern District, and um, it was very active. How many people were in the strike Ten. force? Ten. What happened eventually, after about a year in the strike force, all the strike forces were absorbed into the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I ended up being absorbed into the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District 
and I remained in the organized crime unit. They just took the whole unit and incorporated it into the U.S. Attorney's Office. So there was virtually no interruption at all. So how, how did your mother and dad accept the fact that you became a prosecutor and now you were in the strike force at the U.S. Attorney's Office? Well, I think my father was, um, he was always a little bit disappointed that I didn't go into the business right out of, uh, right out of college. I went to law school and then I did the clerkship and then I went. So I think that you know, somewhat disappointed him, but he, you know, he saw it was a, a good job. My mother was proud. She used to come to my trials and watch. Um, and my father um, uh, didn't really come to the uh, trials very much. I think at some point he was proud of me and because I was doing big cases and, and things like that. But um, later in life, um, he, he said to me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching 80. You have no interest in being in the business, so I'm going to... We'll get to that next week. When we continue the discussion, we'll talk about the cases because there's certain major cases, including the infamous Studio 54 case that you were a prosecutor on, and we'll continue talking. And I'll see you next week. Okay, thank you.